of what do Pope Francis, Justin Timberlake, and Michael Bloomberg all have in common? They all visited Jerusalem this past week. So, Justin Timberlake, when he got off the plane, he made a beeline straight for the wall before his concert, and he tweeted the following, the Holy Land, what an experience. I will never forget this day. Hashtag Israel. Mayor Bloomberg was in Israel last week receiving the first ever Genesis Prize of a million dollars, which he received from Jay Leno, and then promptly gave back. Um, he's going to give back the, uh, the funding for any of you budding entrepreneurs. It's a global competition, 10 prizes of $100,000 available to entrepreneurs 20 to 36. Big ideas based on Jewish values to better the world. So go online tonight and check it out. And then finally, of course, Pope Francis, who was in Israel at the Wall and many other places. And this was really a historic trip, the third sitting pope in the Holy City. So I'm not a rabbi, and I'm not actually an expert on Jerusalem, but I love Jerusalem, and I care about Jerusalem, and I've spent a lot of time in Jerusalem, my junior year abroad. I lived there for five years, and now I work for the Jerusalem Foundation, and it's near and dear to my heart. The image that you're seeing there is from a map from 1581 by Bunting, and what it really shows is Jerusalem at the center of the earth, and I think Jerusalem does feel like, for many people, the center of the universe. And I was going to quote the Psalm 137 again, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand lose her cunning, um, which was something that Theodore Herzl repeated these words in Basel when he convinced the world to build a home for the Jewish people. So I will just add that. Um, Jerusalem is a witness and an echo of eternity. And that's from Sidur Sim Shalom. And again, I'm not a rabbi, but these quotes seem meaningful to me um, as someone who really believes in the city of Jerusalem um, and there's a lot going on there. So Jerusalem for me is a city of dichotomies. It's the past, it's the present, it's the idea and the reality as we heard earlier. Um, it's hope and it's conflict, and it's the universal and the local. And what I really want to talk about today is sort of what is the reality of Jerusalem today. But before I do that, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what the Jerusalem Foundation is, since I spend a lot of time working for the city, and I think that the Jerusalem Foundation does fabulous work, and most of you, I think, at least I hope, will recognize the person on the screen as Teddy Kollek, who was the mayor of Jerusalem for some 30 years, legendary. And right after the unification of Jerusalem, in fact, he took office just before the city was unified, he founded alongside the city and the municipality, the Jerusalem Foundation, because he knew that we needed to develop the city as a modern, vibrant, open, pluralistic city, open to all, and Teddy truly believed in those things, really focusing on the community vitality, the empowerment, culture, and coexistence. And simultaneously ancient and modern, Jerusalem stands as the center of three monotheistic faiths, the crossroads of two continents, the symbol of universality and faith. But Jerusalem of the 21st century is about more than symbolism. It's about more than even history. It is about civil society and social justice, museums and film festivals, commercial development and scientific discovery. Most of all, Jerusalem is about people, people who exemplified every facet of ethnic, religious, and cultural identity, men and women who engaged in international politics, in technological research, in spiritual contemplation, and people whose families have lived in the city for 10 generations, together with those who just got off the plane from every corner of the world people with startlingly different views on just how Jerusalem should look and feel. Jerusalem Foundation founder and legendary mayor Teddy Kollek had a dream of building this multicultural city where all of its people could live together equally, religious and secular, veteran and new immigrant, rich and poor, Muslim, Christian, and Jew. Realizing that supporters of Jerusalem worldwide would need a forum to build this new reality together, he created the foundation. The foundation recognized that all the people of Jerusalem, different as they may be, share common aims to build strong communities, to raise their children, to live together. And to that end, the foundation developed an agenda aiming to improve educational opportunities, close the gap with modern uh, in the city sectors, to enrich the city's cultural landscape, and establish the infrastructure of a modern city to develop a, my, a vibrant Jerusalem that would serve the needs of the residents and its tourists in the current era. And so in the 50 years since, in cooperation with friends of Jerusalem around the world, we've invested about a billion dollars in Jerusalem, about 4,000 initiatives, capital projects, long-running programs, and indeed Jerusalem would be unrecognizable without the foundation. 
The work rises above the city's political complexities to touch every population, Jewish, Muslim, and Christian, religious and secular, every social age group, and every neighborhood. And as the largest city in the country, Jerusalem continues to face many challenges. And we must focus on ensuring that young families can make their home here, including cohesive communities, cultural opportunities, and an education system that will prepare their children for a fast-paced world. We continue to rise to these challenges, building philanthropic partnerships, working together with the Jerusalem municipality, and cooperating with the city's major organizations, building a flourishing, vibrant city, building the future and preserving the past. So what I'm going to focus on today is not everything here, because if we did, I'd be here for a long time. But what I wanted to talk about were the challenges and the opportunities in Jerusalem. And so I'm going to really cover probably two or three of these, the social, the urban, and a touch on the economic. And I'll leave the others for another day or another lifetime. So Jerusalem is not only local, but it's universal. And so many people around the globe care about the city. And we dream to realize the potential inherent in the city and to turn Jerusalem into a world center of spirituality, interfaith dialogue, wisdom, multiculturalism, an extraordinary place to live and to visit. And when we look at the social and demographic issues in the city, it's pretty complicated. In fact, Jerusalem in general is complicated for a visitor and for the people living there. Three separate communities, a very large population, a lot of negative migration out of the city, although we've had some good news today coming out of the city where there's a lot more people tending to move to Jerusalem and many more people staying in, many more people staying in Jerusalem. It's a very complicated education system. Jerusalem is the, both the largest city in Israel, and it is also the poorest city in Israel of the 10 major cities. So these are some stats that we're looking at today. So as of 2012, this is recently updated. We have about 815,000. It's about 10% of Israel's population, as you can see. And it's quite diverse. And where we're heading is this. This sort of describes the character of the city today. So the nature of the city speaks volumes about what the needs are of the city. This is just giving you a little bit more flavor about the city. You can see that while Jerusalem is indeed a microcosm of the rest of the country, its population, and these are 20 and above in Israel and Jerusalem by re religious identification, I don't know if you can see that the red is non-religious secular, the blue, the dark blue, is traditional loosely observant, the orange is traditional observant, the blue is observant, and the purple is ultra-Orthodox. Okay, so one of the biggest problems that the city has had has been the negative migration of the city. So essentially what's going on is more people are leaving the city than other cities. But what's also interesting is while there are people being born in the city, many more people are being born, there still is a negative population growth, and we want to change that. So the other area I want to cover a little bit is what's going on in the urban center. And these are topics that, that we could go into for days. One of the things we're trying to do is regenerate the inner city, make it more livable, connectivity to the center and bring things into the center of town, looking at public transportation. There's been a lack of public transportation and with the recent addition of the light rail that's helped things, affordable housing and the preservation of the built heritage. So in terms of affordable housing, I'm going to address that because I think it's one of the main challenges and one of the main reasons people don't want to stay in Jerusalem and can't stay in Jerusalem. So if we take a look at some of the issues causing this, we can see that from this map, we've got some issue with land reserves. There's limited places where we can continue to build in Jerusalem for a lot of reasons, mostly because of environmental issues. The things that are listed there as canceled and canceled, those are due to environmental reasons that we can't build in those areas in the outskirts of Jerusalem. We're looking at the Sini Center right there in the middle, where it says in dispute, those are for issues around the conflict. So there aren't many places to build outwards, so we're going to have to build in the core of the center. But what's happened is that the housing prices are really forcing people out of the city as well. And because it's the poorest city, due to a lot of different things, people are leaving to other places, whether it's the outskirts of the city or other big cities. And this chart really shows you how much it costs to purchase an apartment, how much it used to cost back in 2008. It used to take 100 months of salary to purchase an average apartment in Jerusalem. At the end of last year, it cost about 140 salaries, so prices are increasing rapidly. Dwelling construction. So if you can see, way back in 1996, we were producing some 3,000 units in the city. It dipped down in 2011 
to about 1300. And we're going back up, but this dip down here, one of the reasons it started to continue to go back up was if we remember the protests that happened in 2011, the government changed their policies and forced uh, building to happen in Jerusalem and in other cities to create more affordable housing. So that's what you're seeing there. The last area I just want to touch on really briefly here is economic. And this is, again, a whole other can of worms that we can go into. But the good news is that there's rising socioeconomic levels. We're trying to focus on narrowing the gap. We want to bring things in, biotech and high-tech industries. But this chart just shows what's going on in terms of the labor force by gender. Not a very happy picture. And here, the participation force by population. So clearly, Arab women don't participate in the labor force, and most ultra-Orthodox men are also particularly low in the labor force. Poverty rate in Jerusalem and in Israel. Tourism, however, is a good thing. So tourism in Jerusalem has typically been very high. It's dipped during the periods when you would expect, during the intifadas, and it's risen steadily. But if we can take advantage of things like tourism, I think it helps build a good picture for the city. And as I was talking about before, Jerusalem is really positioned to be a great place for biotech. They've got a great human capital in the city. They've got a major university, six academic colleges, and several other colleges in film and theater and uh, in, the, in the culture area. Um, so, and also, they're already building and developing some of these, com these companies. Teva is based in Jerusalem and has a big operation there. So how do we make Jerusalem sustainable? This is something that I have been focused on for the last couple of years of my career and something I deeply care about. So what does that mean to make it sustainable? It means that it's a place where people want to live, where people can live, where people can afford to live. And it's a place where there's jobs, and it's a place where people can send their kids with good education. And I think that the exciting fusion of human, social, environmental, intellectual capital that could drive Jerusalem's economic growth largely remains undeveloped. On one hand, the low labor force participation that we talked about, the high poverty rates, the deteriorating infrastructure, insufficient housing stock, the environmental degradation are the challenge in urban growth. And on the other hand, the dynamic creative resources, the population, the scientific and technological base, the environmental diversity and multicultural tourism attractions are highly potential resources for a sustainable economic vitality. After a long time, the city is still held hostage by some intractable political entrenchments, but I'm not going to touch the political today. And I think from affordable housing to the environment, to environmental conservation, to tourism and infrastructure, leaders can come together, think outside the box with market-based solutions that are going to create real economic change for the city and economic growth. So here is a plan for what I call sustainable Jerusalem. And I want to thank colleagues of mine at the Jerusalem Institute for Israel Studies, which is the think tank behind the Jerusalem Foundation, and also at the Milken Institute for Israel Studies, where I worked recently. Um, and so a lot of this is work that's been developed between those two institutes. But it's really looking at Jerusalem through this holistic um, lens, looking at these topics, affordable housing, cultural tourism, the environmental and alternative energy areas, knowledge-based industry development, and of course, education and training. So here's the opportunity. We're going to create affordable housing solutions. We're going to increase the range of housing opportunities, not just for sale, but rentals. I know we're all used to renting properties here in Los Angeles, but there are very few and far between. Looking at culture and tourism, infrastructure development, this means everything from not just building theaters, but also building the necessary mechanisms for people to get around the city, whether it's public transportation or even parking. Integrating and enhancing the natural habitats and the urban fabric. There's a huge plan right now to build a huge urban park modeled after something like Central Park. It's going to be called the Gazelle Valley, looking at creating a green loop around the city and really a preservation site for animals that are native to the area and are being reintroduced, the gazelles. Also looking at alternative energy sources, water basins, and other air quality assets. And the other opportunities that are available is that using Jerusalem's intellectual capital to really develop a biotech industry and other high-tech industries to bring business and jobs and that kind of economic growth. And finally, what's really important, and I could spend an entire lecture on what we need to do in terms of both the ultra-Orthodox, Arab women, people that the underemployment in the city, is we really need to focus on creating a job base by giving the appropriate education and job training, both in the higher education system 
as well as other places to strengthen the job skills for the market so that it's a place where people want to live. So with that, I just want to say thank you, and I think that we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Thank you.